and we're live. First off, Kendall, Lily, thank you so much for carving out some time out of your crazy busy schedule to come on a podcast with an old Jewish guy from Boca Raton that you have no idea who it is. So thank you guys so much. We love thank it. Thank you for having us. We're thank so you. I have been following your exploits on social media. That German Drindle, am I saying that right? That is Drindle. That, that is Drindle. That is a that is a wild dress. Yeah. Well, to, long story short, um, and Kendall can take over at some point, but we were just Ken and I were both uh seniors at uh, film school together and we were friends and didn't, I don't think it actually occurred to us that we were both in the writing program whatsoever because we just had a lot of fun, drunk antics constantly. For four years. Yeah. For four years. It, it took four years to realize we both were trying to do the same thing. And we both studied abroad. I went to London, she went to Germany. And when we came back, we, we started riffing on this like funny concept of all the girls that went and studied abroad and like came back feeling like different and culture. I've been to Budapest and bathed in the baths there. Yeah. So I'm, like, I'm like, really? Okay. Like, really? You feel that way? Like this 18, like 20 year old white girl. That's like, yeah, not really, but you know, so, so we thought it was hilarious. And at the same time that we thought that was a funny idea, I was a production assistant on a TV show on the Sony lot and Kendall was an intern in like the reality department on the Sony lot as well. We're so on like Shark Tank, Dr. Yeah. Oz vibes, like in the development department, not even doing like what we're doing now, really. Sure. So, Ken, you can take this part over. So what ended up happening is the chairman at the time is this man who we have, you can do a compilation of clips where we have said Steve Mosco. <laughs> Because we love him. He's still like, just, I don't know. We're just still really close with him. He's an amazing person. So he was the chairman of Sony at the time. And he, Sony. Sony TV. And he had this thing where all the interns came and he came and talked to the interns. And he was like, I have an open door policy. Come see me. Like, I love to help young people. And up until this point, like everyone I had met who had seemed high up in the industry seemed kind of untouchable and like, wouldn't even look at me. Like, you know, I'm the little like intern scurrying with like the snacks and things, but like Steve was just super charismatic. He's like, look, people told me that like, like, he's like, he, he's like, people told me like not to go to college. Cause I like, wasn't that good in school. Like they told me to give up and he's like, fuck that. I knew I wanted to be in entertainment. I drove, he like, he had to borrow a car to drive to every radio station in Baltimore and pass out a resume, just trying to get like a job when he was like in his early twenties and no one would let him in except for one, like little assistant was like, yeah, I mean, you can come and help us out for free. So he did that. And then long story short, just was a, such a hustler, despite what everyone told him, drove across the country, moved to LA and here we are, I don't even know how many years later. And he like ran Sony TV. Now he's the head of Village Roadshow, another massive studio. So the, he was really inspiring, really charismatic, reminded me of myself, just like the way he was like, Bleh. I was like, I like this guy, feel like he's approachable. So I told my intern friends, I'm like, I think I'm going to reach out to Steve Moscow. And they're like, um, I don't think that he actually meant that. I'm like, no, I think he did. So I went to his office chatted for like th two hours, just about life, about having ADD, about meditation, like all these things. And then he was like, okay, so you, you want to be a writer? Like, what have you written? And I'm like, well, I've written lots of things at the time. The two things I was working on were a period piece, um, uh, that took place during world war two. That was like a love story, but it was really intense. And I was in this like darker headspace with writing. And then Lily and I had started coming up with this idea that was very comedic and light and kind of satirical. And I was like, but which direction do I go with this? And I was like, I just feel like I want to write comedy. You know, I, I, I realized that's what I wanted to do. I was like, well, I kind of have this idea with one of my really good friends. Um, at that point we didn't have a script. It was just the seed of an idea. And he's like, well, come pitch it to me. So oh it was, it was literally like us both coming, coming back to LA from being abroad and like had one conversation that was like, this is such a funny idea. That was the idea. Like, it's not like we had anything developed whatsoever. So Kendall calls me and is like, 
we have an opportunity to pitch this idea to the chairman of Sony TV, who I obviously knew because I was working on the lot. And I was like, I mean, we have to do this. We have to make this happen. Um, we went to film school and we learned all the skills, but we, and, and we, kind of practice pitching, but you really don't know until you do it. Like not like no one really taught us how it worked. No one taught us like what elements of like, um, performance value you're adding to it. Is it casual? We didn't know. So no one told us we had to like be actors as writers, you know, you have to perform basically. Yeah. You know? We were like, if we're going to pitch this idea about satire on, on like girls studying abroad, hashtag blessed to be abroad, then then we obviously have to dress the part. So we were like, well, we have our German journals from Oktoberfest. We studied abroad. <laughs> and we studied abroad and got fucked up in the beer garden in Germany. So we were like, we may as well put on our journals. And we also thought, oh, to make it entertaining, we're going to record a rap of us rapping like the first half of what this pitch is to make it more interesting for Steve. So here we are. iPhone photo booth, like a janky little iPhone photo booth video. Yeah. So here we are on the lot and um, we, we strut in, in our outfits and it's like everyone in their cubicles, like looking up like, Oh God, Oh God. Did extras get lost? Like are, are they from background? Like <laughs> should we gram? Like, <laughs> making them go in the other direction, but we walk directly to his like penthouse office, knock on the knock on his glass wow. door <laughs> and he lets us in and we, we pitched our asses off. Do I think that it probably in retrospect looked a little, a little kooky? Yeah, but he totally loved it because we literally gave it our all. Like we gave every ounce of our heart and soul to that. Um, and I think he probably thought, oh, I'm giving these girls a chance to have an opportunity in a room pitching. Um, what he didn't realize was he actually kind of liked the idea and he liked what we had. And long story short, he, he slapped his hands on the table and was like, I love this idea. Like I'm going to, I'm going to help you guys out and, and pass you along to happy Madison was the production company, Adam Sandler's company that he passed this along to. But anyways, you asked about the German journals and that was the reason we, we were in them and we don't dress up that to that extent anymore when we pitch projects, but we do definitely just, just for good vibes. We add a little bit of a costume piece to make us feel in character. Well, let me play a little clip of this here so you guys can see this, what this looks like. <laughs> you guys are hilarious and you're so funny. Have you always been yeah. funny? Yeah, totally. I can, it, it comes from, doesn't it come from like, like, I don't mine know. comes from trauma, but you could answer your thing. <laughs> I think that my, I think my funny comes from like being um, a true observer. Um, I think that from a young age, I've I've always I've always observed to the extent of realizing that things were a little bit odd. Whether whether it was like familial relationships, whether it was like you know kids on a playground, like I always just kind of watched people, and with that, I found the humor in life. I think, yeah. Yeah, I feel like, like, I, and also I think we, me and Lil both talk about this, but we were both in our own respective ways. Like I was such a misfit when I was younger. I was awkward. I was like an underdog outsider and without going like super into it in like fifth grade, I got this really rare, like neurological disorder. And I basically couldn't control like my facial expressions or my movements. Like I actually couldn't control it. I was like, you know struggled like a little bit and, and I'm like, not allowed to laugh at this but everything it's just fine it's just it's like it was but anyway this happened I got it from strep I got strep throat I got this thing called sit in hands chorea that doctors didn't really know about I couldn't control anything couldn't control my body and everyone I quickly learned I before I was like kind of the weird girl with a ton of imaginary friends and I had like my best friend and we were playing like bridge to Terabithia like on the playground but then I started to realize everyone noticed me and I couldn't help it so I was like okay I can either use this for my my advantage or I can like absolutely like like this is my only option to be the funny girl to be the funny one in school mm. and I embraced that and I knew people were laughing 
if people weren't laughing at me, they'd be laughing with me. So I like went with it. And I think that my humor straight up like came from that part of my life. Like I attribute it to that. Um, is, it hard, I, is, it, is it hard to be around people that don't have your sensibilities? I think that we honestly surround ourselves with the same sensibility. Like I find that there's, it, it's funny. We have a, we have a friend who's a comedian and he, he, he said it perfectly. He was like in LA, there are the people that like follow the status quo a bit, like go, whether they're in the entertainment and they go up the ranks or whether they are just a kind, nice person to be around. There's that group of people, which are amazing and rightfully so, but, but then there's the group that we probably are categorized in which are the weirdies and the weirdies are the ones that are like more misfit more odd man out but in entertainment yeah, an actual job. Mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i think that we know a lot of the weirdies yeah and yeah. so you and when you when you met each other in film school you were friends first and then you become writing partners you could have chosen anybody i want to start with you lily what was it about kendall um actually it was really fun well I don't actually know. I, I remember the first time I saw her, I worked in the, on the on-campus coffee shop and she was sitting in the area that was only for the baristas that worked there, which was like, why, why in my head, I was like, what the fuck is this bitch doing sitting in our area? And we all were like, all of us were like making fun of her behind the thing being like, she's not allowed to sit there. And then when I went up to her, she was like, very, not what I expected she would be like very, like I had an idea in my head of what she was versus how she actually spoke. And Kendall just has this thing of being very unfiltered. There's literally nothing that's, that's filtered about Kendall. And I, I thought it was funny and interesting, but it was really, honestly, at that point, I did not think that we would work together at all. It was really when we started coming up with ideas, there was a, a synergy that I feel like I could maybe come up with an idea with anybody, but then I get tired and bored of it after maybe 10 minutes. And with Kendall, it's like, we can, we've been able to do this for like eight years. One of the things I liked about Lily a lot was I felt like I had, people had mentioned her name to me. And I think that people had like had perceptions of who she was. And then when I met her, I was like, what the fuck? This is not even who she like. I just felt like I saw her and I was like, she's the coolest person ever, you know, like it was like their perception of who she was, was different than she actually was. And I felt like what she said about me, where it was like, not what you expect. That's how I felt about Lily. You know, you both mentioned this theme, which I want to just explore for a second, because I think it's interesting where you both had different perceptions of what each other were like before you met each other. And so many times in this world, we judge people based on their political views or based on what we think they are, why we look at them, the circle of people that they go through. Has it made you look at people differently when you meet people now, like because of this experience where you don't judge so much, which a lot of people do. I think that we, we like don't judge to a fault almost because we, we collect people, we see the best in everyone. I think that it's, it's really interesting, but if you think about it as a writer, when you're writing dialogue, you, it's not like you're just writing from the perspective of you for every character. You have to, at every given time, be able to be able to write a response that like someone who's not you would say. And because we like, because we've stepped in so many different characters shoes, I think that that is now I think that's given us so much more empathy. You kind of feel this oneness with everyone. I'm like very spiritual too, but I just feel like we are all one. And the more that we can like tell stories that like make people see that, I think, I think that's, there's a lot of power in that, to be honest. Does it, does it translate to your personal life too? Like when you meet people that maybe share a different perspective than you about something, Yes, this comes up a lot in so many different ways, but something that I've realized recently is that although I'm an outspoken person, I stand up for other people more than I stand up for myself. And the reason I don't stand up for myself is because I, when I'm in an argument or something, some anything, any sort of confrontation, I do see 
so clearly the reason they're reacting the way they're reacting, that it's hard for me to be mad at them. I can't be mad at this surface when I know what's behind it. And so it's hard for me to just in that moment, stand up for myself when I feel like maybe I'm a little bit more aware than they are in a situation. I've really, it's, it's, it's given me this like more, I would say like 30,000 foot perspective on a person, on every person I interact with. Like I'm, I've gotten a lot better of realizing like nothing is actually personal. Like we're all just projecting our, our traumas and our things onto other people. And the story that's going on in here isn't actually the reality. A lot of times, am I projecting onto this person? Is this something deeper that has nothing to do with this situation? And the more that I can do that, the more I can just sort of choose like the high road with these situations, because I think at the end of the day, like it's like what you said, everyone just kind of wants to feel, feel heard and seen. And I think this, these perspectives of putting yourself in other people's shoes, it just really, it really helps. And then I think it's the key to like peace in your life, because the more you realize that nothing actually has to do with you, the more freedom you have, man, that's powerful for personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me shift gears a little bit one story that really grabbed my attention when I was watching you on TikTok. One of the first videos I saw was, oh my God, oh my God, you're not going to believe this. We're having lunch with Nicolas Cage. So it's just outrageous and goes to show that there's no right or wrong like way to be in this industry, I feel like, or try to get your foot in the door. Um, We we long, long story short, again, we really needed jobs. And there's been times when we've found really odd gig jobs on Craigslist. And um, we decided to do that again. Kendall found this listing. It's it essentially said like entertainment people to speak on a panel, which in my head, I'm thinking, what kind of people are they hiring off of Craigslist? That makes no sense. Of course, we signed up for it because we're like, we need the money. There was out of everyone there, there was one producer that we wanted to meet. So we go up to the producer and we start talking to him. He he was like, oh, he's like, oh, sorry, not to be anything, but like, who are you guys? Like, what are you doing? Like, what are you working on? And we were like, well, we don't, we, we're just starting out. Like, we don't really have anything going on. We found this off of Craigslist. And he's like, what do you mean you found this job off of Craigslist? And he was like, you guys are joking, right? Like, this is a joke. This is a bit. And we're like, no, it's not a bit. Essentially, he thought we were funny because of that interaction. And he's like, can I read something of yours? We were like, yeah, absolutely. We'd love you to read something of ours. That was the intention. So the next day, sent over material. And then he asked to meet with us, which projects us to the week after when we meet at a nice restaurant to meet with this producer to discuss our material and potentially working together. Um, Something that we do a lot in this industry and Kendall and I get there and we're a little bit early 20 minutes goes by it's time for him to get there he's not there we both order a glass of wine we're like we may as well enjoy ourselves maybe another 30 minutes goes by Kendall and I are like this is ridiculous let's get another let's get another glass of wine he's bailing on us like it's just gonna we're gonna hang out tonight that's it we're essentially about to leave and then I'm sitting facing the front door, Kendall's sitting facing me in the restaurant. And I see the producer walk in who we're supposed to meet with. And then about five feet behind him, I see Nicolas Cage. And it's a nice, sorry. It's a nice- Is that Nicolas Cage calling you right now? Did he, oh, go ahead, go ahead. So he, so we see Nick walk in and I don't think anything of it um, because it's LA and you never know who's going to be in restaurants, you know? And, um, and then all of a sudden I noticed that Nick is making his way towards us with the producer. So Kendall turns around and Nick walks up to us and introduces himself and is like, hello, I'm Nick K. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, hello, I'm, I'm Lily. This is Kendall. Like there wasn't that much of a reaction because we were so confused and we sat down with him um, and just started talking because what are you supposed to do? It's not like I'm going to sidebar with this producer and be like, what's going on? Instead, you just, roll you just roll with it. And that's what you do in this industry. You roll with it always because this shit happens and you just have to be able to just function. I feel like, yeah. um, Oddly enough, the simple Craigslist ad was just supposed to be a way to make a little extra money. 
Yeah. When you get there, you see this opportunity, you see this person you want to get in front of. You then have to think to yourself, once I get in front of this person, I'm going to have about two minutes to make some kind of an impression that hopefully plants a seed that when I follow up with something, he's going to maybe spend a little bit more time with me. And so when, when you actually are in that line waiting for your moment, in that moment when you're actually a, approaching this person, what goes through your head? Well, okay. So I, I think that I have a little bit of a rule in my head. I don't, Kendall might be different, but I don't like to, I really genuinely do not like to just go up to people as a fan or as someone who I like to be introduced to someone, even if it's not even a big introduction, just something, because I think it puts you on a different playing field automatically. If you can't do that, then you have to find some sort of way to naturally bring up a conversation without like walking directly up to someone and being like, Hey, because it automatically feels a little bit too formal. So for us, it felt like if I, if, if we like kind of shuffled our way into his direction, had our own conversation nearby, um, continued speaking at some point made eye contact, then get into a conversation and in the back of your head, have the ideas that you want to bring up, like the pitch you want to bring up the advert, the ad of who you are, whatever. I think that you, you pull that out when it's appropriate to pull that out. And what worked was if it wasn't the humor of us, also that naturally happened, us talking about why we were there. And we didn't think he'd think that was funny. We thought he'd think it was weird. So that naturally happened. But I always try to come up with some casual way to relate. And then and then it's like, oh, what do you do? Or oh, then it's if they ask you, then it feels a little bit less forced. Mm, um, I think I think the key here too is like kind of going back to even what we were talking about with like the writing thing, but it's like at the end of the day, whether it's Nicolas Cage or like the intern, whatever, like everyone's a a human there's relate to them, like connect with them. Like, what are you both like vibe with them? Like on that level and just like talk to them about that. And then the other stuff will follow with Nick too. We didn't immediately start talking about business. Like we allowed him to say, what do you do? We had a staring con. Funny that he didn't know what we did, what we did going into the meeting, but we, we talked about whatever we talked about. And then it turned into, Oh, what do you, what do you two do? Well, we're writers. Oh, well, I'm actually looking for writers right now. I'm looking for a writing partnership because I have a project I'm working on. Oh, really? What's the project about? Oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's interesting. We actually have a project that's similar so that he knows that we're used to that experience or whatever. So then we kind of pitch casually our project, which made him feel more comfortable that we knew the material. Yeah. What's interesting is, is it's almost like you're piquing some curiosity and you're letting him pull it out of you rather than you pushing yourself on him. You could have easily gone on for 50 minutes right there. Well, we met in college and we did this, but said, Hey, we're writing some screenplays. Exactly. And I, I have like an interesting, like, um, example of this, but I, I have a friend who recently, like overnight became famous, one of my best friends. And it's really interesting because we were in New York city last week together and everywhere we went, people stopped her on the street. And I would say 95% of the people behaved like fans coming up to her. It was like, Oh my God, I watch your videos. Oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. No eye contact with me whatsoever. Not even for a second, only on her, like, like zero to 60 really quick. There was one girl out of, I would say about 65 people that came up to her throughout our week trip there. One girl who casually came up and she goes, she was like, Oh, Hey, Hey, you guys, first of all, looked over at me, her best friend. So it's like, it made it more of a casual situation. It was like, Oh, I watch your videos. Like I, you know, I love what you're doing. Like keep doing that. That was awesome. And you know what? My friend responded in a way that was so different than all the other people who came came running up like fans and responded and was like, Oh, thank you so much. What did you think of this? Like, is it weird that I'm starting to do like brand partnership stuff? No, it's not weird. Like that's the natural progression. Like, no, we're going to still love your videos. Thank you. So nice meeting you. And that was it. And it was such a better situation where if, if she ran into her again on the street, don't you think she'd remember her versus all the other people that were like, essentially like approached so quickly? This has such a strong relation to what salespeople do, right? So salespeople are very much like the 95%. Let me 
let me call and dote all over you, Mr. and Mrs. CEO, about how great you are. And let me tell you about myself and what we're doing. And what you're suggesting here is to take a little bit more of a subtle approach. Hey, I really like what you did there. And then just be quiet and let the sort of conversation unfold a little bit. And I, I think back to the beginning of our Zoom call today, and I did what 95% of the people do because I am a fan and I can't help myself. But as I'm listening to you, this is a great takeaway for me, which is to kind of like calm down a little bit. Getting someone's attention is one thing. Keeping someone's attention is much harder. So I want to understand at that lunch, what did you say that caused the text afterwards? Because I know there was some interaction afterwards. I saw a video of you, Lil, and it was one of the happiest moments I've seen in watching all of your videos where you're like, oh my God, oh my God, he texted me back. You were kind of that raving fan behind mm -hmm. the scenes, of course. You're not, you would not do that in front of him, but I could see what an exciting moment that was for you in a, in a, in a sea of moments that aren't so exciting, which we're going to get into. But what was it that you said at that table in terms of the pitch or the conversation that intrigued him enough to, to have another interaction with you? Oh, I, I think it was because we were really real with him. I think it goes back to what we were what we were just saying. Um, we didn't we didn't blow out all our steam in the beginning and then have nothing to talk about. We we like slowly worked through the conversation, brought up other things, you know, interesting, funny little facts, like little jokes here and there, like the witty moments. But let them speak. Let them have their normal whatever when they get dinner together. Um, made it casual and comfortable. And I think that's the only reason that we kept his interest because in our heads, we're thinking, well, he's getting a lot of people when he's meeting them on a first, when he's meeting for them for the first time, he's getting a lot of people who are probably really intense. Well, let's just create a safe space mm -hmm. that everything is just going to be calm. And I think that's the only reason we continued developing this project with him for so long was because it was this, um, there was a trust, I think that was probably a lot different than when he first meets someone. It partially helped too that we had been drinking wine and we were kind of stunned because like when he walked in, we didn't react like fans. We were like, we, I was like, am I hallucinating? Like this is, but then when we sat down, I think also we kind of were like, what is the situation? Why did this guy bring Nick? What's going on? And I, I even think like, at least that was me. I think that sort of like, I'm going to feel, I'm also the type of person that like, I have a big personality, but I also kind of like to feel a situation out slightly before getting into it and like wanted to feel what was going on. And I think doing that and not being like, oh my God, you're Nicolas Cage, just being like, hey guys, so like, how's, what's your, what's, what's going on tonight? I think that he liked that. And I think ultimately like we did pitch him an idea that we were working on, but we were telling it in a very organic way. It's he's feeling that he get he's feeling connected to that. So I, I think it's like the same thing we're saying where it's just like, yeah, that, that organic, like pulling it out and sort of like, I think there's a level of trust. I don't think you can even articulate like what that synergy is when like you're getting dinner with like a good friend or like someone you care about. Like you can't describe what that synergy is. Like you're not thinking beforehand, what are we going to speak about? You're just kind of like going into it and it feels more natural. I think there is a certain magic. And I think that magic comes from this place of sort of like like flow and just like receptivity to like what the other, and like a yes. And perspective too with mm -hmm. Lily and I, where it's like, we're not like, I just feel like we're super open. It's like this open space where it's like, Ooh, that idea is great. And then like, Ooh, that idea is great. And it's like, too, when we're creating, there isn't like a personal, like, Oh, you just said, like, you don't really like that version of my idea. I'm going to be pouty about it. It's like, Ooh, no, I like where you're going with that. But like, what if we spun it this way? We could make it even better. We're mm. working as a team or like a solution. We're being like solution oriented rather than like, I'm going to go journal for five hours about how Lily didn't like my idea. And, and, and Kendall, you did something else that I thought was really amazing. One of your videos Talk about trying to get in front of people. You're very creative at this. We talked about the German dresses. We talked about the Nick's Cage Craigslist. We haven't gotten into the Craigslist killer yet. We'll save that for a second. <laughs> but 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 this idea of then tapping into LinkedIn. I do have to say we've gotten like a couple meetings off LinkedIn, but really what I think it is, is you find people like it's like you can find them mutual, like look up like Loyola Marymount University is where we went to college. So you look that up and you find connections like two co connected through one person, two people, whatever. When you write something, it's like, say something that's like, and like 
what initially you're looking for. I'm a writer too. Would love to connect like as the first thing and then end it with like, love that we both went to LMU, you know, it's like, just be upfront. What do you want from the conversation, the directness of it? And then end it with like, Oh, cool. How are we connected? How is this like a human thing? How do we get like, and I think when you can do that too, and with LinkedIn, at least there's a picture. So they put a face to the name. It's like, I think, cause our business is so personal relationships. Like and that's everything that Hollywood is. It's like, mm-hmm. this person knows this person. So I'm going to refer you to this person. Like that's how it works. And the more, cause I think people like to feel comfortable and they like to find a common ground. So when you can do that, you can do that through LinkedIn. Cause it shows you who you have connected. You yeah. Know, I mean, in, in our industry, if you're reaching out to agents or managers, there's no way that they're going to respond to you. If you just blanket, just reach out. There's just no way. Like you can follow a certain set of directions, like make sure your headshot is on like a clear folder when you mail it and like, make sure you add this and don't email, just mail, like maybe they'll see it. But really the only way that they're going to respond to you is if someone, if you have, even if it's like a childhood friend, it could be like a professor that barely knows them. Anyone who just has a tiny connection is like, I want to introduce you to this person for some reason. It just, it clicks a little bit more and like, we're not even hot shit whatsoever. But when people reach out to us, it's definitely like when there's some sort of connection or some sort of like, or there's that trust initially, like what Kendall said, when it's like, I want to reach out to do this or talk about this. Also, by the way, really, you know, really great stuff you're doing or really, or blah, 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 blah. I think it's just, there's, there's automatically this, this level of, um, oh, okay. I know what they're saying. I know what they're doing. And I respect that because I'm the same. I, I want to talk to people all the time about certain things. Is this the hardest part of this gig getting in front of people? Is this the hardest part? Yeah. It is. Well, actually, I don't, I don't know what I would say. I would say the hardest part of this fucking gig in this industry is just getting people, the gatekeepers, the gatekeepers, the people that hold the power, the top of the power, like the studio, the people that run the studios, those people, you know, getting them to move, getting them to catch up with the enthusiasm and the creativity. Like we've written some Apple spots and we loved that because working in tech, it's a lot more innovative. It's a lot quicker. It's a lot like, like we're going to move with the times and just see what sticks. And I feel like we have that energy, but in a world that's very like, I'm going to move one chess piece. And then six months later, I'll move another chess piece. And it's like, God damn, can we just not be afraid? Like, can we just, just, be create. It's like, it almost messes with creative flow a bit and it bothers me. I love talking about this. Up. Yeah. How, how did that, how did that come to be the Apple ad? Uh, so I was stay I, during the pandemic, we both like back and forth were with our parents. I would, I didn't, I was like, didn't have a place to live for two years, was traveling around to like wanted a break from LA was with my parents in Northern California. And I, this is another example of just like, life just sort of happens. And I was like, wow, I'm 27 years old in my childhood bedroom, like living with mom and dad. And this is just like, this is a moment. Um, and they finally had these cool two like neighbors move in next door. And before we had been like the neighbors that had lived there, we, they never put up Christmas lights. Like we were like, who are these people? They're really depressing. So Mary and Jules are <laughs> their names. They moved in. And they were just like, one was an artist and the other one was in creative advertising. And they just seemed really cool. Like I was like, mom and dad, these need to be your new best friends. They're a little younger and hipper than you. Like maybe you guys can like connect. And they wanted to have them over for dinner and their son's interested in acting and wanted to talk to me about the industry and like kind of just get some advice because he's looking to go to school for acting and just kind of how it is on the, the front that, you know, the screenwriting front. So they came over for dinner and actually it's funny, but I told them, they were asked about what we do. And I talked about Lily and I, and I actually told them the Nicolas Cage story. Cause like they thought it, they wanted to hear it and they thought it was super funny and they were laughing. And then like two weeks later, uh, my dad's friend uh, or the the wife uh, reached out to my dad and was like, oh, does Kendall and her writing partner, like, do they ever write like non, you know, TV film projects? We're actually looking for female voices right now, you know, to be a part of like this team um, and work on one of our like campaigns. And my dad was like, oh my God, like, yeah, for sure. So he passed our info along. The most amazing experience from this was the fact that they 
a lot of times in our industry, you have to, when someone's interested in working with you, you have to write something to prove yourself before you get hired and with them. It was like, cut all the bullshit. It was like, we already, we know you guys can do it. It's fine. And, you know, they barely, they looked at some of our videos in a portfolio, I guess. And then it was like, oh, you're hired on this project. So we did, we did this, uh, worked on this short form video that was like under six minutes that was casually branded content. And then that, that video, I mean, I think it got like 33 million views. Now, but for this Apple ad, this is a different thing. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of get into the space of Apple ad from crazy German dancing. This particular project wasn't that far off. It was very aligned. It was about these four underdog characters trying to start this company. And they're all, and like one of the meetings, I remember my computer was about to die. And I like, I, we were on this zoom with all these very high up people at Apple. And I like, I was like, oh my God, I have to grab my charger ran and had full pajama pants on the bottom and these like embarrassing socks and like had to go grab my charger was plugging it in. And I remember like the head, the head of the meeting was just like, it's so funny. Uh, our writers are literally our characters. Like we just like, we just very much like were related to these characters because they're hustlers. And that's, I think what the whole thing was. So it, it was an aligned thing for us to work on. If, if someone wants to find this spot, what's, what's it called? Escape from the office on YouTube. Two minutes till we have to go back in. Uh, I hate being back at the office. I hate having 30 minutes for lunch. I hate Vivian. it. Vivian. Yep. No, Vivian. Oh! If you're not back at your desk in 10 minutes, you're fired. Do you guys ever dream about quitting? God, I wish we could quit. Why can't we? We could do our own thing. Yeah, like start our own company. Be our own bosses. We could get our weekends back. I could wear sweatpants every day. Bridget. 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 Let's quit. <laughs> All right, um, last couple questions. What pissed you off last week, each of you? Let's start with, let's start with Kendall. What's something last week or over the last couple of weeks that kind of pissed you off a little bit or upset you? I would say it's funny enough, but it's a lot of what we're, it's a lot of what we're talking about with a gatekeeper. I'm feeling, sometimes I'm feeling a bit like my hands are tied and I'm just like banging against the wall like this. I feel like um, it's that and maybe not wanting to be this like, um, pioneer and like write what we want to write and just like charge ahead and like do all these things and feeling like all these people are just telling you no, 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 because you can't write a character that doesn't look like you right now because it's a sensitive time, even though you feel like you connect to the humanness of this story and it's a dad daughter relationship, but like you can't write, you know, that character because it just isn't a good look right now. We have to be real, we're really sensitive. But it's like, it's like that shit that I just, I'm just so sick of because I don't think it's threading the needle forward. I don't think that that's helping us. I think it's a bunch of scared people when the pendulum swings from one way to the next way. Well, we're still going to be really, we have to be really sensitive, but you ask the average person unfiltered what they actually think. And they're like, fuck that. That's stupid. What do you do with it? I feel like you believe in you're like what you're trying to put out into the world and the reason that you feel like why you want to do what you, you want to do. I feel like you, you know, you, yes, you take account, like, you're like, okay, what are the times? How can I use this to my advantage and maybe pivot? But at the same time, what is the core reason that I come back to wanting to tell this? And you, you hold that vision and you trust that the person who believes in that and sees that those people are going to come to you and mm -hmm. it's going to work out. Um, and that everything is working out. I like, I go back to just like my belief system of like spirituality, but I do think it's like, you have to trust that there's like, everything is working out for you. Um, and I think that like, you don't, you have these dreams or these things in your heart. We all have this, like these, these passions, you know, and I feel like it's because it's, it's our destiny kind of like, it's like what we're meant to do. And I think like, there's a reason that we want to tell a certain story in a certain way or whatever it is. I think that you have to hold that we're pitching a movie right now. And I think that hearing back, I love this idea a lot. Um, but come back when you have a script. Um, 
because it used to be that you could kind of, you develop out an idea and you sell it on a, on an idea, but now writing a script means we have to spend six months writing a script, getting notes from our producers to then bring it back when the industry might change. Um, so I think it's the, it's the flippancy of what people, of what this, what, what the industry is calling for. So similar things to what Kendall's saying, where it's like, it, there's just not a lot, I don't find that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of value. I mean, I don't find that, I don't find that writers are treated with that much respect in this industry, but it's ironic because they're the ones that start the whole project in the first place. Well, listen, there was also something Lil, that I saw you experiencing. You were doing some gig at some place, handing out flyers or something at a, an event. <laughs> and I think there was a friend of yours there from college and you didn't want to, you didn't want to bump into her for whatever you know reason. And, you, and there was this moment where you're like, down on the floor and you're like, I just can't do this anymore. Like, this is not what I want to be doing. You, and you keep going though. When I watch you, I'm like, you get past that. So in sales, we have this all the time. There's so much adversity. All the salespeople that are listening to this are sitting behind a computer. They're getting a base salary upwards of six figures. They're making commissions. They're behind a computer. If they have a bad day or they don't sell something, they still get a paycheck. Yeah. Not, not the case with you guys. How do you how do you come to grips with that? How do you keep going? Because I look at that, I'm like, wow, she got back up from that. Because that looked hard. That looked like a hard night. Yeah, um, that ha that happens a lot. And I would say that the only thing that brings me out of those situations is just the pure comedy of how ridiculous and relentless that this all is. I don't even think it's passion and fire under my butt. Like, I think it literally is just straight up comedy. Like in that moment, you talking about that just now, I was like, oh, this this is why we need to write a TV show about gig workers because it's funny. Like it's so many people have to, it's the, it's the era of gig workers right now too. So many people have to have to do a million jobs and um, no, it, it's, it totally sucks sometimes. I don't know, Lily, but I feel like I have this voyeuristic perspective to my own life. Sometimes I just feel like I'm watching myself on a screen and it's like VR and I'm laughing. Cause I'm like, if this is the character's all is lost moment, except for we've had about 95 of those. I'm like, this is funny. Cause like in the all is lost moment, there's always a dark end of the soul, but then there's like the ending and it's tied up in a bow. And so you just kind of keep going you're waiting for your happy ending. And I think at the end of the day, like every time we have a low, we go through emotional, like purge, whatever. And then some sort of comedy is birthed. Like this is fucking funny. And it's like, yeah, but also it's this, industry, this industry brings you really low and then brings you really high. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting too, because I don't really have an addictive personality. I don't know how, like, I don't know how I keep doing it and doing it, but like it pulls you really high and it gives you something like, Oh God, now I have to keep going. All of a sudden, Nicolas Cage calls, or you yes. want me. And, and I see that it's like a roller coaster. Exactly. Mm -hmm. People want to find your content. How do they get to you? How do they contribute? How do they join the cause? Follow us on TikTok, please. Comment on every single video we post because it helps our algorithm. We are we just started uh two girls, one script spelled out, so not the numbers, it's spelled out. Um, TikTok, Instagram, uh, YouTube, you can subscribe to us as well. We are going to have a podcast called Two Girls, One Script. I appreciate you guys. You guys are the best. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Josh. This was, this was awesome.